So we're delighted to have Hilary Wainwright, who's travelled from the UK this morning. And she's editor of Red Pepper magazine and website, which spices up politi politics with content about Europe and emerging uh, countries. She's a contributor to the Guardian newspaper and is also an author, which she'll tell you more about, and research director of New Politics Project of the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. Sorry about this. I, I don't know quite what consequences it'll have. Anyway, I'm really, really happy to be here. I mean, for me, Dublin's been very sort of culturally exciting and romantic. You know, I studied Yeats and I read Strumpet City. And so I was really excited at a cultural level to be coming. But now I'm excited materially. You know, I think this, is, this discussion is going to be really important in terms of the future of the economy and also the future of politics, which is something I'm really interested in. So I'm, in a way, I'm a little bit of a kind of um, disappointment because um, really you should be having Mike Cooley. I don't know, he's a fellow countryman and maybe some of you, I know Esther here and, and Tommy, uh, knew him well. But his importance for this discussion was that he was, um, or he is, he's very much alive. Uh, but uh, I'm talking about a historical role that he played. He led uh, an initiative called the Lucas Aerospace alternative plan for socially useful production. How many people have heard of that? Okay, so not many, so I better explain. Because I think the conditions were very different from now. This was in the, um, the late 70s. No, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, well, sort of mid, throughout the 70s, and um, particularly sort of um, mid-70s, really. Um, but then also at the Greater London Council, um, in the 80s. Um, and it's a story which, in the end, has been a politically and economically a defeat. But, but like many defeats, the ideas live on through people. You know, people recognize a, a good idea and, and work with it and apply it under new conditions. And that's what's happened to this, this, this project. And basically, he was like a sort of top designer uh, in um, Lucas Aerospace, which made sort of components for missiles, sort of really mainly military um, products. And uh, in the early 70s, as was happening throughout um, the UK, maybe here too, uh, companies were rationalizing, you know, the sort of old imperial sort of, you know, relaxed sort of complacency of British management was leading to uh, companies that were increasingly inefficient. And so under pressure of competition, they, they kind of, May, tried to make themselves efficient, but efficiency meant basically um, sacking workers, cutting what they considered to be costs, uh, and, and, and closing factories and rationalizing and so on, and often acquiring other companies. So it was mainly a sort of financial um, process of rationalization, not a real increase in productive efficiency. And at Lucas Aerospace, there was a very strong... Um, Shop Stewards Combine Committee. Again, I don't know um, whether everybody's familiar with the sort of history of the trade union movement, but, um, and I don't know quite how far conditions here in Ireland are the same as in, in, um, in, the, in Britain. Um, but, but in Britain, the trade union movement is very diverse, and there's quite a difference between, well, I'm talking historically, between the strength and organisation of workers in the workplace and at a national level. And, and locally, in, in the workplace, and then across companies, shop stewards, um, workers come together across different trades, so that you know, in an engineering factory like Lucas Aerospace, the um, high-level designers like Mike, who was in a union, AUW TAS, would work very closely with the general workers who were called unskilled. I mean, in fact, they were skilled in all sorts of different ways, but but officially unskilled workers. They'd all been one single um, shop stewards committee. And then as trade unions, local trade unions recognized that, that really they weren't just up against local management, but up against a corporate decision-making process that would be, you know, comparing company, comparing factories, you know, pitching one group of workers against another. They then combined and created a, a combine committee 
And the Lucas Aerospace Shop Stewards had created a very strong combine committee, and this was in the, um, by the mid-70s. Uh, it was a very, in, in sort of economic trade union terms, it was a very strong uh, committee that won high wages, um, good conditions, you know, very militant, as were many uh, shop stewards committees in, in the UK at that time, particularly in engineering. And in the face of redundancies and closures, their first response was to take industrial action, you know, maybe to strike, maybe to occupy the factory, you know, and refuse the closure. Um, but this didn't, didn't work. It, it, you know, they, they needed some kind of alternative. They couldn't just say no. And that, so this was already going on in their minds. At the same time, there was a very, you know, if people remember, um, this was the time when the miners brought down Edward Heath, um, a new Labour government included people like Tony Benn, who'd been very radicalised by um, occupations like the UCS uh, shipbuilders' occupation, where the workers occupied and didn't just occupy, but actually kept the shipyards going and showed to people like Tony that, um, you know, that actually it was the workers that had the kind of interests of industry. I mean, it, this links in quite a lot with what Tony Murphy's been talking about. You know, that it was the, the workers that actually believed in, in the skills and capacities, their skills, um, and in the potential of manufacturing industry. And so they, you know, whereas the employers on the whole were just interested in, in short-term sort of profits. So it was the workers that occupied the, the, the shipyards and kept them going. And this very much influenced um, Tony Benn. So when he was um, faced with the question of whether or not to nationalise the aerospace components industry, which had been a, a political commitment of the Labour Party, his instinct was not to simply rely on his um, sort of civil service officials, nor even to simply get on the phone to trade union leaders but to actually make contact with the shop stewards, the workers, the designers, the engineers who had the skill and had the capacity that he'd learned from the Upper Clyde shipbuilding experience was, was where the energy and capacity and vision was. So he, much to the dismay and sort of shock of the civil servants, he opened his office to the shop stewards of Lucas Aerospace who all came and met him and he said, so... You know, I, I, I could be nationalising Lucas Aerospace. Is that what you want? They then had a, 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 a meeting, which is a very, a very good tape recording, to discuss what did they want. And um, what, what came out of it was a feeling that, well, nationalisation, you know, it hasn't actually... A lot of them came from the northwest, where there are a lot of pits, um, or the, in the northeast too. And they, they knew that from looking at what's happened to the mining industry, what happened to the railways that actually nationalisation didn't change much, you know. Actually, it, often what would happen um, was that sort of, you know, retired majors, retired officials from leaders from the art, not leaders, I mean, what do you call them, sort of the, the, the generals and sort of um, high-ranking officials from the army were put in to, to sort of run the nationalised industries. So they ran it in a traditional sort of command and control way. They didn't listen to the workers when uh, there were economic problems, they, they sacked the workers as in the private sector. So the workers in Lucas Aerospace said, well, no, I don't think we should just go for nationalisation. We should be thinking about what we, we can do. And Mike, and this is going to be very much a starting point of what I wanted to say, um, substantially. Um, you know, Mike made this point where he said, this was a time, this was the 70, 70, Five-ish, so there'd been the oil crisis and everybody was talking about crisis. And he said, there is talk of crisis wherever you turn. I think we have to stand back from that crisis for a few moments and see where we are in relation to it. For it is the present economy that has a crisis. We don't. We're just as skilled as we were. Miners can dig coal, bricklayers build houses, and we can still design and produce things. And this was the key starting point of Lucas Aerospace that I think is relevant today, to start from the skills and capacities of the workforce. And they said, well, let's talk to our members, let's ask our members, our you know, fellow designers, fellow engineers, fellow general workers, about what, what they think their skills and the, their machinery could be put to use to produce. Do we want to carry on 
producing missiles? Or are we aware of other needs that our capacities could, could be used for? And so they, that began a long discussion in all the factories with all the shop stewards committees and so on, involving the workers in developing a plan. And the kind of ideas that came up were all kinds of very um, socially purposeful ideas to do with medical equipment, to do with um, transport systems, a kind of a, 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 an idea of a road rail vehicle that would you know, combine working on the roads with working on the rails. Um, kidney dialysis machines, often you know, machines or mechanisms that would help disabled people. There was a real awareness of the kind of, as Tommy's talked about, for now, you know, in our present conditions, between the huge gulf between the kind of potential of technology and how far it was realized for the good of the people. So remember Mike would always talk about you know, how you know, Concord has, has sort of you know, massively shortened the diff distance time-wise between the US and, and the UK, while at the same time blind people kind of still hobble along the streets with the technology they had in medieval times. And so this feeling that you know, there was great sort of um, technological capacity, but it wasn't being used to meet people's needs. So this plan that the workers at Lucas, Space, Lucas Aerospace drew up was really trying to apply their immense skill to people's needs, whether it was disabled people, people in third world countries, the health service, the transport system. And they produced this plan called the Lucas Aerospace Alternative Corporate Plan for Socially Useful Production, which is a bit of a mouthful. And the thing is, it wasn't a long document, because the other starting point, which I think is relevant today, was not just an appreciation recognition of the skills and capacities of working people, you know, which, is, which in a way sounds a bit of a cliche, but actually, you know, is not built into the institutions of, of certainly the Labour Party. I mean, you know, I remember reading the diary of Beatrice Webb, and she had this incredible statement, and she was, she was, her ethos was fundamental to the institutions of the Labour Party and social democracy. And she said, I haven't got it here, but I can read something like, you know, um, uh, we, we, we cannot trust... Um, the average sensual man, the average person, really. They can describe the problems, but they can't prescribe the solutions. Hence, we must bring on the professional expert. And in a sense, the whole kind of um, ethos of, 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 of social democracy, as we've known it post-war, has been that idea that actually, you know, the, the solution lies with the expert. Um, that's the sort of notion of the state that has been built up in the health service, in teaching, in you know, throughout the in industry, throughout the sort of organisation of the of the of the social democratic state, and the idea of the people having that practical knowledge um, is just completely absent. And towards the end, I might say something about the public sector because I think a lot of these ideas about um, participatory alternatives, the kind of things that Tony was talking about, very much applies to how we could rethink the public sector. But anyway, going back to Lucas Aerospace, just quickly. So, so this, these ideas about the um, importance of people's skills, but then the importance of people's practical skills, a lot of these skills were, were tacit. Um, I've been reading recently some management books about the, the knowledge-creating company, you know, and it's all full of this sort of recognition of, of tacit knowledge, you know, things we know but cannot tell, things that can't necessarily be written in documents. Uh, and this was fundamental to the, um, to the Combine Committee. And so what they did was not just write documents about alternatives, but actually produce prototypes, produce um, a kidney dialysis machine, produce an energy conser conserving um, sort of fridge type mechanism that worked in the opposite way of a fridge. Um, produce, they produced a, a, a road rail vehicle and they would go on sort of tours around the country showing these, these alternatives so that people not only, you know, was it, it, it based on the idea of tacit skill but also on the idea of sort of almost agitprop that sometimes propaganda is better by example than by, you know, lots of documents and lots of leaflets. Anyway, this, this alternative plan then became a crucial instrument in, in bargaining, in, in, in trying to argue with management 
look, you know, actually, you, you don't need to close this factory. Why not, instead of getting government to buy missiles, why not, you know, shift production to these, let's say, the medical equipment and get the, the government to, to make health contracts with you so that, in a way, that would combine both a bargaining um, strategy towards management and a return to Tony Benn saying, OK, it's not so much nationalisation, or if we have nationalisation, it would be to implement uh, this kind of alternative plan and therefore change the procurement policies of government, shift government spending away from defence towards socially useful kinds of products. So this was, this was an alternative which also had a, a clear strategic purpose in terms of bargaining and, and political campaigning. And this is where we come up against something that Tony didn't mention. It would be good to... It's a question I'd ask about, which is, you know, like the vested interests of management in, in their sort of prerogative, you know, the, 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 the way in which management is determined, you know, to hold on to that prerogative, their prerogative, their, their power. So that a lot of the ideas that the Lucas Aerospace workers had are ideas which are now put into practice in German companies, for example. You know, they're not, they're not outlandish ideas, but the idea that they came from a group of workers <coughs> was completely unacceptable to management. So management refused even to discuss the idea. You know, to them it was absolutely unacceptable that workers uh, should be the initiators of, a, of an alternative investment strategy, an alternative product strategy. So I think there is that problem of vested interest, of corporate management that is not respectful of workers' uh, intelligence, and, and partly because it would shift the balance of power in the company and actually force a kind of industrial democracy and the kind of collaboration that Tony's talking about. So that's one problem. And then the other problem is that the trade union leaders too, you know, were shocked, were kind of affronted by the idea that, that their own members should be getting together across, you know, union boundaries and coming up with alternatives. So they too, in not in all cases, but in some cases, refused to support the initiative. And then the government similarly, um, when Tony Bennett was kicked out by uh, Wilson and under pressure from the CBI, um, the government too refused to give its kind of backing. So, so that initiative was up against serious institutional constraints. And I think when we when we think about the implications of what Tony is saying and and what Tom is saying um, about the new technology and the new necessities of a different kind of um, company and a different kind of um, way of organising the economy. We've got to recognise the, the actual um, sort of inertia and conservatism and vested interests of our existing institutions from companies through trade unions through to political parties. Um, so I think, you know, what does all this mean for now? I mean, I think the, the Lucas story, it sort of lingers on, you know, sometimes I'm involved in a magazine, Red Pepper, that's mainly run by young people and I'll be sitting in on an editorial discussion about let's say the environment and alternatives and there'll be somebody saying you know I, I heard about a group of workers some time ago that that did talk about conversion about converting industry um, you know in new directions and I kind of say well do you mean the Lucas Aerospace and they say yes yes that's Lucas Aerospace that's it and so, you know, this was 30 years ago when they did this, but this, this idea of, of, of workers' organisations taking the initiative to convert the, um, the use of their skills and the use of the machinery they work with for socially useful purposes, I think has huge relevance now when we think about how do we, how do we convert um, the present kind of high-carbon economy to a low-carbon economy, to an environmentally sustainable Economy. How do we um, achieve the kind of conversion to use the new technologies that Tommy was talking about in a way that um, doesn't damage people's livelihoods, but but you know enables a slow or a kind of democratic transition? And I, I think that, that the Lucas plan shows it's pos it's possible that in terms of capacity and workers' capacity, or well, not just workers, but working people generally because a lot of communities were involved in this initiative. It is possible. The question is what organisational forms you know, will actually um, facilitate it or make it, make it possible. And here, I think um, 
you know, one can see a possible new direction for trade unions that, that in a way what the Lucas Aerospace Combine Committee did was it shifted from being a, um, a union whose main purpose was to campaign around wage levels and, if you like, the price of labour to being an organisation that campaigned around what, what Marx called use value, you know, the, the, the purposes to which labour was put. And, and a, a, an organisation that actually became a way of sharing practical knowledge, tacit knowledge. I mean, there's a discussion in several of the contributions about entrepreneurship, and it's interesting to compare this dynamic with um, the sort of free market kind of ideologues who, you know, when you read Hayek, you know, the great kind of Thatcher's her hero, um, he talked a lot about practical knowledge, about you know, tacit knowledge. Um, and his idea, this was a critique of the state, the idea the state is all-knowing, a kind of critique of Beatrice Webb and the sort of presumption that the state could know what was in the need, interests of, of the people. And he said, no, you know, we need to rely on practical knowledge, the knowledge, and he, for him, it was the knowledge in the minds of the entrepreneur. And for him, this tacit knowledge was entirely individual, almost constitutionally individual, almost like our arm or our eye, or our, it's almost like it's, our, it's an individual's knowledge. And what the Lucas Aerospace Combine Committee showed, and I feel too also the women's movement showed in its consciousness raising groups and so on, is that actually it's not a choice between sort of scientific knowledge that can be centralised and codified and imposed from above versus sort of practical knowledge which is just embedded in the individual and therefore only the market can coordinate it. But that actually a whole lot of organisations have emerged post-68 particularly, both in the trade union movement and in the women's movement and the environmental movement, which is about sharing that practical knowledge, socialising that practical knowledge. And in a way, you could say actually, and I think it's true historically, particularly in California, that those social movements, they kind of provided the, the culture that produced the web, uh, which is a very cooperative mechanism. And that in a sense now we are, I really agree with what Tom is stressing, is you know, we are at a kind of potential tipping point if we can resolve these social and political problems, that the technology now enables a real possibility of collaboration, of sharing the practical knowledge which we saw with the Combine Committee at Lucas Aerospace, but which was then crushed by the old centralised sort of institutions. And I think that, that local, where, where is that collaboration and cooperation most natural? And where, the, you know, where is it going to be most likely to be supported? And I think the local level is where it's, it's going to be most sort of creatively used. But obviously the other great asset of the new technology is its possibilities of coordination. So we can have both decentralised and distributed initiatives and forms of production and forms of coordination. When Roland speaks, he'll describe to you the, the coordination of the fab labs. And I won't go into it now, but that shows that sort of real potential. And finally, because I think I need to stop, I think that this also is reflected politically. I mean, this is all very kind of emergent, but if you think about what's happened in Spain, the emergence of this extraordinary party, Podemos, which is a reaction to the, the, an extreme version of the sort of uh, centralized but corrupted um, political system. And they've been able to do this because they've introduced a kind of, um, well, the, the logic of the new technology, a kind of, distributed form of policy making but coordinated through the through the internet so a kind of crowdsourcing approach to policy so their latest conference included about 250,000 people you know contributing to the the program and the ideas of this party which had its roots in the the movements in the squares but i think you know in a way an, a, a politics like that that's that's, that can be coordinated enough to challenge the, the existing political system at elections, but whose energy and creativity is based on the, the individual contributions of people you know, using the kind of skills and capacities that we've seen in Lucas Aerospace, is the kind of politics which would have responded well to the Lucas initiative. So I think that 
technologically a lot is in place and it's now up to us to use our ingenuity and creativity to think of the appropriate organisational and political forms. So it's over to you.